Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, campus minister at the University of Toledo. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, we have this idea that we are the masters of nature and that it is put at our disposal and that, that we sort of could do anything we wanted with it. This viewpoint has often been contrasted with the viewpoint that one would find in the Eastern world where things of uh, nature would be more respected. Joining Father Basic in this discussion is Dr. Julius Gillis, Professor of Economics at the University of Toledo. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of a Christian response to environmental problems. Here's Father Basic. Jules, I know you as a professor at the University of Toledo and a colleague of mine there. And uh, um, What is it exactly you teach at the university? I teach urban economics, economics of crime, and micro-theory. Well, I don't want to talk about any of that. I understand, that. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that. Maybe the one about the, the, the urban situation. I thought that perhaps we could talk a bit about environmental questions. And the reason that uh, that is because I know that you have a, a feel for nature. In fact, of uh, all the people I've met, you sort of impress me as, as having a, a deep down uh, sort of affinity for the, for the natural world. And uh, I've um, talked to you about that kind of thing informally in the past, and so I thought maybe we could deal with that and take you out of your field. I know that's not fair. I mean, professors always like to talk about their field, and I'm sure you could deal with all of that uh, clearly. But I'd like you to talk with me a bit as a, as a layperson and about something that you sort of know from another angle, and that is uh, the world of nature. So are you willing to do a little bit of that? I'm game for it. And uh, perhaps we talk uh, about nature in relationship to environmental problems today. Let me uh, set the stage out of my own theological framework, and that is the charge that very often Christianity is uh, opposed to nature, that Christianity is part of the problem of pollution in the world. And it goes something like this, that in the Judeo-Christian tradition that we have this idea that we are the masters of nature, and that it is put at our disposal, and that uh, we sort of could do anything we wanted with it. This viewpoint has often been contrasted with the viewpoint that one would find in the Eastern world, where things of uh, nature would be more respected, where it almost would seem as though the deity inhabits that world. If you think of the sort of pantheism we know in Hinduism, you, you get some sense of that, that... Um, that God is almost in that. Well, you think of the sacred cows in India, for example, where uh, people wouldn't touch them even if they were hungry because they are so sacred, because it's almost like the deity inhabits them. Whereas in the Christ Judeo-Christian tradition, there's been a distance between God and nature. God would be revealed in and through nature, but it would not be God itself. And therefore, some of the response in the Judeo-Christian tradition has been, well, Therefore, you can do whatever you want with it. Therefore, you can destroy it and, and so on. And I'm wondering if um, we couldn't use that as a sort of jumping off place. Uh, and, and maybe we could talk a bit about the kind of problems that have ensued in the Western world, the kinds of environmental problems we've got right now, maybe in general in our world. I think that's a very interesting jump off point. I myself really do not see a conflict here between the Judeo-Christian idea that man is supreme and everything else was created for him or her, uh, where a man can do whatever he wants with nature and so forth. I think as long as man does not harm himself with his actions in the realm of nature, I don't think there's a contradiction between the two ideas. 
I guess what's happened is we have harmed ourselves, though, haven't we? Because, we have harmed ourselves. Yeah, because There's no of question the way about we it. have polluted the streams and so on. Yes, and, with uh, uh, all various forms of uh, lead in the rivers or uh, lead in gaseous form, for example, uh, uh, that is being expelled from the expressway ramps, and uh, this heavy gaseous substance is settling upon the low-income dwellings and uh, there is a tremendous amount of lead in the children of the American large cities. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, in the, among the poor. Huh? Among the poor, simply because uh, the poor districts are interlaced with expressways, mm -hmm. and this heavy form of lead oxide just rolls from the expressway upon the roofs and into the windows uh, of uh, the lower-income groups who live in the central city or uh, more specifically surround the downtown areas uh -huh. we call it the gray area uh -huh. uh, this is not the problem of course uh, in the suburban areas simply because we have uh, stronger winds there uh, we have uh, more trees uh, probably to neutralize some forms of uh, particularly carbon dioxide I suppose this certainly does not happen in the central cities so, uh, Jules, what, are, what would you say are some of the other large problems we're facing, as you see it, with the, in, the, in the pollution area and the way we have messed up our environment? I suppose, I mean, there's the obvious things that the layman knows uh, with the, the factories and uh, uh, the kind of things we hear about in Los Angeles where the air is uh, polluted. We know uh, the car emissions uh, do a lot that way. Yes. We know that uh, generally the, the, the waterways are not doing well. Our lakes get polluted uh, and so on. Interesting with Lake Erie, isn't it, though, the way it's coming back in some ways. That's a very oh, hopeful that's very note to throw into that to analysis. The return of the pickerel and so on, which Indeed. has just thrilled Indeed. many people and put people in touch with nature again, been good for industry and tourism for us and so on. Indeed. Well, I think, I, in a sense, we're over-industrialized, and I should be very careful how we use this uh, expression, over-industrialized. If 200 years ago some sort of a leather factory was expelling some form of acid into a stream, and that was the only factory, the stream itself washed the chemicals, destroyed them, uh, broke them down into uh, harmless substances, but as more and more factors were built along that stream, more and more acid was poured out, and the river finally became impotent to deal with these chemicals. So from that point of view, I use the word over-industrialized. Uh, what we are doing now is actually in this sort of a capitalistic society where we're only interested in the bills for which we are, which we are forced to pay. But when a factory uh, em emits some sort of poisonous substance into the airstream or into a river stream, the factory realizes that it does not have to pay in, in, any, in, in any form for this sort of uh, activity of getting rid of garbage. We certainly cannot throw garbage bags out of the windows because of, of moving cars because this is a very obvious form of solid pollution of the streets. What is much more subtle and, uh, is uh, when uh, some sort of factory lets out a stream of uh, sulfuric, concentrated sulfuric acid into, uh, into to a riverbed, and uh, what that factory is doing is exactly what that careless motorist is doing, dumping in an authorized manner uh, into a, a public, uh, pub, uh, public stream, mm -hmm. just like uh, the motors is throwing garbage out of the window uh, upon a and public thoroughfare. I guess in the past we just haven't noticed that kind of pollution, and uh, I guess we're becoming more aware of it now, aren't we? And uh, with the uh, EPA and the uh, environmental rules and so on, and greater efforts to control industry in this way. That's right. We have not noticed it. We have noticed it perhaps a little bit too late, only when the first serious... Uh, vectors of damage were inflicted upon our, our society. Mm -hmm. This is yeah, a very that, serious... It's a pessimistic statement. It may be too late, isn't it? Uh, don't we get some comfort from what I was saying about Lake Erie coming back and uh, people saying the Maumee River's getting cleaned up? I think the Thames River in London, they did remarkable things there. 
uh, in uh, returning the life to the lake, I mean, to the river and so on? It, it is never too late, Father. Mm -hmm. uh, that is for sure. Uh, when I said it's too late, that I meant that we should have done something about it much earlier mm -hmm. and would have averted the damage that was already inflicted in some places, perhaps irreversible. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Some lakes cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for us, Lake Erie is improving continuously year mm -hmm. by year. Uh, but um, in how much progress we will be able to make in the future in this area depends how much money will be allocated from the federal coffers to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, private companies in a capitalistic society, of course, are not willing to do that because nobody's forcing them to come out with these uh, payments and so forth. In other forms uh, of societal forms, like uh, socialistic economies and so forth, uh, companies have no choice but come across with a certain amount of payment to clean up the mess that they themselves create. Mm -hmm. Jules, I was thinking, too, of another environmental problem. I was just uh, reading the literature from uh, CARE uh, this morning, and they were they have a large campaign going to help uh, with um, reestablish the forests in various parts of the world. And I was reading the analysis, and it was the idea that the increase of uh, uh, the agricultural effort in these developing countries is actually hurting them in the long run, so that what happens is they need wood for fire in order to uh, heat their food and to uh, some places at least keep themselves warm and that they would keep cutting down the forest to get this and they would end up with more land than that they could farm but in the long run they're really hurting themselves and uh, the the appeal for the money was to plant trees for reforestation to take place in these developing countries, and CARE is making a massive effort in that regard. So I, I guess that would be another example, even in very primitive societies, where uh, the way that nature is used or interacted with helps produce human problems in some way. There's no question about it, particularly in our Caribbean, neighbor, neighboring Caribbean islands. Uh, there was a tremendous abuse in this sort of activity. He, there the farmers course do not have as much money to spend on fertilizer so what they do is denude acres of virgin forests plant whatever crops they are planting for two three years until they use up all the nutrients and move on denude hundreds of acres mm -hmm. uh, in new areas what happens eventually is this that uh, many of these islands of course are not level slightly mountainous and a serious erosion problem arose. So uh, all kinds of roots are being exposed from all the trees that are still standing, and more trees are just toppling over now. And uh, there is another problem, uh, particularly further south of the Caribbean islands, where when they denuded acres, acres of mahogany forests, they realized that the amount of rainfall in the contiguous areas changed drastically. So here they have more crops, they have less rainfall, and uh, that is a very serious um, uh, catch-22 problem that's arising. Uh, 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 right, and I guess CARE is one of their responses is that they want to plant the trees, and they were saying how mil many millions they have done already and intend to do, and they have matching funds from the government, evidently, to carry this out. One of the pictures I got is that to uh, even to plant trees along the arable land that they are farming, and... For, I guess to cut down on the winds that soil that erosion, to, soil erosion, yes, and uh, that indeed, would eventually indeed. damage the crops. Yes, yeah, very important to preserve uh, patches of forest, if particularly if you're driving around our plain northwestern uh, state of Ohio. Here, you'll see uh, large patches of forest mm -hmm. uh, among cornfields and wheat fields, and that serves a very important function. There is no accident that those trees are there; uh, they are stopping the wind. Uh, and preventing erosion, soil erosion. Uh, soil erosion. Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess, Jules, if we continue our analysis here, we have to look a little bit at the uh, problems of the nuclear waste as well and the way that those are potentially uh, great problems for us and uh, how we're going to be able to dispose of all of that. I know a lot of the people who are against the nuclear power plants, to say nothing of the nuclear weaponry, uh, seem to talk along that line. I'm never quite sure what to make of all of that, 
but that we're uh, producing waste material here that it becomes almost impossible to deal with over the years. This is, I think, the most serious problem with atomic energy. It's not that the plants are unsafe. What is unsafe is the disposal of the used-up nuclear material. The technology, the science, is incapable of dealing with this problem. Where do we put tons and tons of uh, radioactive material? So the material which will be alive, meaning radiating uh, for hundreds of years without harming the society. Mm -hmm. uh, should we just dump them someplace in the, in the Pacific and at least not harm the Americans, but harm the people that live in those uh, other islands? Uh, uh, this would be uh, really an, an, an Christian kind of act, even though I heard that some sort of uh, plans are being made to, uh, to, to do that. To do that. Thing, yeah. You know, that would be a violation, too, of justice in terms of Indeed. relationship between Indeed. countries. You know, Jules, when we're, when we're looking for answers to uh, a lot of the, these kinds of problems, I think that one line of thought has always been, well, science will provide our answers in a way. Science uh, produces progress, and uh, the, almost the mentality has taken over some that I'd like to call scientism, which sort of makes a god out of science that thinks that science is the ultimate way of interpreting reality and of improving the society in which we live. And I think in the 19th century there probably was pretty a general notion and early in the 20th century that science would liberate us from all of the evils, that science would help us overcome disease and would eventually help us to feed everybody and so on. And I think that one of the things that's happening now is that that scientism as a comprehensive viewpoint of the world really is called into question on its own grounds. In other words, more and more people are realizing that what the technological society has produced is not just good, although that's there, but also the, the problems for us and the kind of pollution that we're talking about is probably one aspect of the problem that results. We also got people penned up in factories and unhappy with their jobs and so on. Well, well we had the Luddites in England mm -hmm. often who were the people who wanted to run around destroying machines mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And I myself don't mm -hmm. want to get into a Luddite uh, mm -hmm. kind of viewpoint where, you know, I want to be anti-technology in any way. Mm -hmm. But I do think the balanced viewpoint is, is to recognize that uh, science and technology in the modern world has produced many good things, but also a lot of poor byproducts as a result. And uh, any analysis is going to have to bring that into play. I guess part of my sense is that what it's shown is that scientism as a religion or worldview is uh, deficient, that it won't really make it, and that's going to throw me back and my thinking back to my Christian tradition and to say what framework can I find there for dealing with these environmental problems. I really myself do not see any problems with science per se. Uh, the real problem, I think, is how the results that science produced are being used. There is a lot of confusion in this area due to the single fact that perhaps, and I stress the word perhaps, we're making too much progress now in science, which may result into serious confusion among the scientists. Do you realize that every day 6,000 to 7,000 scientific articles are being generated in our, on our globe. What scientists can really digest this sort of information? Mm -hmm. We're drowning in this information. This is a, as, as, as I saw it referred someplace, information pollution that we're <laughs> yeah. suffering. So we're back to pollution <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but I am myself optimistic that or in the future uh, we will make enough progress that we will resolve this very secret, serious nuclear waste pollution problem. I think we must. We, we must. We have to. We destroy ourselves. We will eventually. destroy ourselves. Now, indeed. Jules, what I would like to get in at this point is what you were suggesting before about a, another way of looking at that Judeo-Christian tradition, which is uh, not incompatible with uh, trying to improve our environment or put positively a, a Christian viewpoint which would enable us to really tend our earth with a proper care. And I, and I think that it is found there. In other words, uh, we have uh, resources within our Christian tradition that, that, that are very different from that. I mean, we have the idea that what we were really put on the earth to do is to tend the garden. 
that we were stewards of the creation, mm -hmm. not to abuse it and not to use it just for our own advantage, but to think about the generations that would come after us and to try to care for it in the proper way. And I think that, you know, as you go through the tradition, you can see good elements. Like, I think Jesus, you know, had that sense of the creation. The way he talked about the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. And um, not that he was on an a environmental crusade or anything, but I think there was built into his attitude sort of a respect for nature as part of God's uh, garden that we are tending. And then if you go on in the tradition, you find... Uh, people like St. Benedict and so on, and, and people who really uh, cared about the world and uh, the, uh, seemed to live the simple kind of life. I think of St. Francis of Assisi, which everyone mm -hmm. would identify with, I guess, in terms of the love mm -hmm. of nature mm -hmm. and his ability to talk with the animals or uh, to uh, befriend uh, God's creation. Uh, talked about the sun and the moon as his brothers and sisters and, and so on. And and right up to our own time, I think, where, you know, I get a lot of enlightenment from uh, the Jesuit paleontologist and geologist, Teilhard de Chardin, who talked glowingly of nature and of uh, our uh, the need to sort of build the new heaven and the new earth. So what I've tried to do there, I suppose, is just take a little survey of the Judeo-Christian tradition and hit some highlights. But what it tells me overall is that uh, we don't have to be people who just abuse our earth that we're really called upon by with God to co-create that world, to make it a little better in some way. There is really no need for that. Of course, when uh, we're talking about God as creator, who was the ideal creator, created is whatever he created ideally with no conflict. Of course, uh, we, uh, uh, I say we, the scientists, we are far, far removed from that. We are not even creators, really, in the fullest sense of the word. And uh, very often, one creation uh, harms or impedes progress, uh, helps progress for one group of people, and uh, on the other hand, harms some other people. So we lack this perfection. We lack this perfection. Can we get an example and, of that? Uh, are you thinking of the way we make industrial progress in the United right. States and maybe use... Uh, third world labor to do it third or, or use a third world or even less, uh, this idea of even the thinking of dumping in, in, in nuclear waste outside the boundaries of the United States is I think a good well, illustration of that. Well in the way we did that, that when uh, through uh, the mm -hmm. uh, tests in the atmosphere before the atmospheric uh, test ban treaty Indeed. we would have uh, been guilty of uh, spewing that yes. all over our globe yes. wouldn't we? Yes. But uh, what is even more uh, frightening is that uh, nuclear energy, of course, can be used for peaceful purposes and would create a tremendous amount of good once we improve the, this technology uh, by, by a few more notches. On the other hand, this nuclear energy idea or, or reaction could spell the end for this Earth. Right, that's so good. how are those creations used in the hands of humans? Right. I, I think it's your point is well taken. The technology there. itself, uh, you don't it's, want to think of it as evil. It's but neutral. Th that's it's right. Neutral. It's, it ends up how the humans uh, want to use it. it. And, of course, uh, that I, I would be looking for the signs of hope again, you know, in ways that maybe we have become more conscious of this. We see the ads on television with the... Uh, Indian man and the tear in the eye because mm -hmm. of the way yes. nature is being mm -hmm. uh, abused. abused in one way or another. Well, I wonder, you know, some people might like that, some might not, but I'm wondering if we aren't creating a sort of different consciousness among young people in this regard, that we're not supposed to just litter our country and we're not supposed to uh, pollute things. I wonder if we aren't uh, raising our consciousness on this, and maybe even that corporations are becoming more responsive in some way. Somehow I'd like to think that. Get any inklings of that? Well, I think, uh, regards the youth of America, I think there is a new awareness that was inculcated already at the, in their minds at the grade school level, high school level, and I think there's a lot of hope in this area. As far as industry is concerned, I see progress in some areas of the country 
and hardly any progress in other areas of the country, particularly since we're living in a capitalist society, profit-making society. Certain parts of the United States, particularly the parts that want to develop very rapidly, do not have any environmental controls as far as new companies are concerned. They just want to attract their business in their area. As a result, a lot of streams, particularly in the southwestern United States, are totally destroyed, totally destroyed. Even though they still look very beautiful and charming, there is no life in them anymore. So what you're saying really is that we have a mixed picture there, but it certainly needs a lot of improvement as we would uh, go along, and especially that some of the corporations are not being as responsive as they in, should. Indeed. Uh, so, so some are extremely responsive, and some are very negligent. Right. Uh, Jules, it's uh, been good talking with you about this question, the problems of the environment, very large problem that I'm sure we don't exhaust here. But my uh, care, again, is to say that out of the Judeo-Christian tradition that I see resources here that could make us more conscious of our stewardship of the earth and would really move us to try to, as you say, co-create with God uh, a better environment for all of us. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, campus minister at the University of Toledo. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Dr. Julius Gillis, professor of economics at the University of Toledo. The topic of this week's Reflections was a Christian response to environmental problems. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mary Beth Kirshner.